Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. This is the 6th of October. As always, I have the chapters, so you can jump to any particular update you care about. And super quickly, uh, we did hit 225,000 subscribers, so I created that number in binary donuts. And yes, that's so I would have more um, donuts to eat. But uh, appreciate all the support as always. New videos this week. So I dived into deployment stacks. This is a new capability. So when we think about doing our infrastructure as code and deploying that infrastructure as code, instead of those resources now really having no connection to each other, they're now a set of managed resources that are tied together so I can then make updates, I can clean them all up even if they're over different resource groups and subscriptions, but also it gives me deny assignments so I can block certain types of actions against them. And so I dive into all of those capabilities and it, it really is a fantastic technology. And I really, really quick video on using dynamic groups based on a date as part of the rule. So for example, the employee hire date, I can create groups based on, hey, did they start within the last year, the, the last week? They joined two weeks ago. This is a really nice capability to give access to resources or maybe applications based on some date-based resource. So on to what's new. On the compute side, Azure Container Apps now has support for Azure Savings Plan. So the Azure Container Apps give us that managed, abstracted Azure Kubernetes service with Dapper and Keda for all of our microservice interactions and advanced scaling and network capabilities. And Azure Savings Plan lets us get cheaper compute based on a one or three year committed spend. But unlike reserved instances or the Azure reservations, this is for any region and any of the included compute services. Well now Azure Container Apps is one of those services that I can now get reductions on um, as part of my Azure Savings Plan. From using Generation 2 virtual machines, I can now seamlessly move them to Trusted Launch Enabled. Now what that seamless means is I still have to stop and deallocate it. But then what I can do is I can go and change the security type from standard to a trusted launch virtual machine. Obviously the virtual machine has to be running a SKU that supports trusted launch. My image has to support trusted launch. But then, hey, I'll get that secure boot capability. I'll get that virtual TPM that then gives me those capabilities of measured boot from the UEFI all the way through to the operating system. It gives me protection against root kits. Um, it gives me that full attestation. It is a one-way change. So once I, I go to Trusted Launch, I couldn't then just go back to a regular Gen 2 virtual machine. But hey, if I want to take advantage of those capabilities, I can now do it without having to re-image or recreate the virtual machine. Azure App Service Backup Restore will now work to a storage account or from a storage account that is firewall protected. Now this app service has to either be integrated with a virtual network or I'm running an app service environment which just inherently integrates with a virtual network. But now I can actually have a storage account that is protected by firewall rules and I just make sure I grant access from that virtual network um, where that app service is deployed to or integrated with. On the networking side, so this is an important one. If I have resources that live in a virtual network, then there are explicit ways I can give them access to the internet because they have a private IP that's given from the subnet they're in in that virtual network that's not internet routable. So if I want them to be able to talk to the internet explicitly, well, I could give that VM a public IP. Generally, we don't want to do that because I'm not abstracting away the connectivity. I can't point to multiple resources for resiliency, for scalability. I could put that VM behind a standard load balancer that has its own public IP, so it's an external load balancer, and then I can have outbound rules to give me access to the internet. Or the best option is I have a NAT gateway deployed and linked to the subnet. That then performs that SNAT, that source network address translation to give me access. But if I have a VM, 
that doesn't have any of those explicit options defined, well, then I get this implicit access to the internet. It's an IP that Microsoft specify it could change. It's not secured by default. It gives me access to anything. And so that implicit option is going away. So the end of September 2025, so we have two years, that implicit option will be gone. I have to use an explicit option. So a NAT gateway, put it behind a standard load balancer with outbound rules. Again, I'll probably stay away from the public IP unless it's a very, very specific scenario you want. There were a whole bunch of other retirements they announced, but I really wanted to call this one out uh, because it's a big one. On the storage side, so Azure NetApp Files Customer Managed Key is now supported in Gov regions. So for that data at rest encryption, I bring my own key in my key vault um, to protect the data. On the database side, so if I'm using Splunk, but I also maybe have Azure Data Explorer, the Azure native service for gathering huge amounts of metrics and time series data and just any type of log that I can then run analysis against, what this add-on lets me do is it's an add-on in Splunk. And what I can then do is I can trigger actions based on a new index that I will create in Splunk. And those alert actions can then send the data to Azure Data Explorer. So it's a way to get data from Splunk into Azure Data Explorer using this add-on that I would install in the Splunk system. And then miscellaneous. So log alerts for Azure Resource Graph is available in preview. I thought I'd covered this before. We're used to the idea of I can create alert rules and I can create alert rules on things like, oh, hey, data and log analytics workspace. Then they added the ability to have data from Azure Data Explorer. Well, now I can also trigger based on the Azure Resource Graph, that very performant um, set of ways to interact with ARM control plane uh, metadata that it has. And I can even join that with other tables. So now I can create those log alerts, um, including the Azure Resource Graph information. Azure Backup Enhanced Soft Delete has gone GA. So we always think about um, potential malicious actors and deleting our backups. And so what Soft Delete does is even if I delete the backup, it keeps it. It retains it for a certain amount of time, which then means I could restore, recover that backup data. So what this capability gives me is between 14 and 180 days. 14 is the default and 14 days is free. If I want to extend it to a longer period, I have to pay for that additional time based on the storage it's saving. But what I can do with this enhanced soft delete is I can make sure it's always on and it's irreversible. Thus, I can protect it from any malicious actor trying to do something to remove my backup. So then, hey, I have to pay some ransomware or whatever that could be. And this is GA both for the backup vaults and the recovery um, services vaults. And then backup vault multi-user uh, authorization has gone GA as well. So this takes it another step and what this lets me do is I can create something called a resource guard. So it's a different resource. And typically I wanna put that resource in a different subscription, maybe even another Azure AD entry tenant. And then I link the backup um, vault with that re um, resource guard. So to my recovery service vault, I link it to the resource guard. And what I have to do is I'd have complete separation of duties. So I, as the backup administrator, have no standing permissions on that resource guard. So now if I wanna perform a protected action on this, the backup vault, I have to go and get a temporary role granted to me on that resource guard using PIM. So I get elevated up for a very small window of time. I can perform the protected action and then it gets removed from me again. So I can't have any standing permission to perform privileged actions against uh, my backup vaults. So this is a really nice capability and it is now GA. As a new region in Italy, it's Italy North and it will support availability zones. So I have those independent power calling networking capabilities. And then Microsoft Playwright testing is now available in preview. So this is gonna give me a fully managed service to run those Playwright tests 
that are really useful for the end-to-end -end testing of my web-based application. So what this will let me do is I can scale to very large numbers of workers that can perform large-scale testing of different types of rendering engine. So I could use Chromium, I could use Firefox, I could use WebKit, running from Windows, running from Linux. I can emulate mobile platforms. I think there's a, an Android and a, a, a Mac-based mobile emulation capable there. But it's a way to automate that testing of my web-based app so I could integrate it as part of my deployment pipeline and get all of that using my, my Playwright tests. So Playwright is open source, so it's very, very widely used. And that is it. Um, as always, I hope this is useful. And until next video, take care.